Sentencing for murder is an emotionally explosive area. If life meant life, we'd all be a heck of a lot safer. For many, life should mean forever. And not so long ago in New Zealand, it did. Over the past 25 years, the murder rate in New Zealand has remained steady. Yet the number of lifers in prison has increased. This is because people are being held in prison for longer than ever before. We have very high rates of incarceration, but they haven't delivered what they were supposed to deliver. It's senseless having crushing sentences, sentences that crush, that give people no hope. If you're going to accept a level of crime and give a pathetic sentence for it, then you're going to get more of those crimes, in my opinion. This series looks at why and how this has happened through the cases that shocked the nation. Here, yeah, you want a good look? We talk to the country's leading legal experts and lawmakers, the insiders, revealing what they really think about how to punish killers. We track the people campaigning for even harsher sentences. We hear from the families of murder victims and speak with murderers. Facing murderers is something Radio New Zealand's court reporter Anne-Marie May does every day. But one case stands out in her mind. It's the winter day here in Wainuia Mata today, but on the day that this all happened, it would have been bright sunshine, summer day, early in January. There was walkers, mountain bikers, all sorts of people on these hills on the day that Graham Burton was being searched for. Four people were maimed, a father was killed, and Graham Burton became one of New Zealand's only double murderers. This incident terrified the entire nation for months. The public demanded to know how this dangerous psychopath could possibly have been released, and people blamed the parole board. Sir David Carruthers was chairman of the board at the time. It was my fault and my responsibility. Those faces uh, remain with me. Predicting the behaviour of criminals and balancing risk is the terrible task the New Zealand Parole Board must undertake before those serving life sentences have any chance of being released. Parole is a privilege, it's not an entitlement. You're going to see these people who literally have your life in their hands. They'll say something or give something away in front of the board. Here's on the back of your neck to stand on end. Should murderers ever be released from prison? In this episode, we explore the real cost of murder, its toll on the family of victims, the penalties a murderer must pay, and the price society pays for justice. Burton had already killed before the Wainui Amata rampage. The question on everyone's lips was how was he able to kill again? Graham Burton had had quite a traumatic dysfunctional upbringing by all accounts and had got into drugs and alcohol at a very early age. And in 1992, he'd been refused entry to a nightclub in Wellington. On the stairs, he met a lighting technician from that club, said, do you work here? The guy said yes, and he killed him. So he went to jail for that. He came under a regime which required him to serve at least 10 years. Uh, before he could be considered eligible for parole. Offenders are entitled to have legal representation at parole boards. Some lawyers are very good at making sure their client, the offender, the criminal, has ticked all the boxes, OK? Grant Burton was a classic example of that. He memorised what he should be saying with absolute con the parole board. His release gradually unravelled. He started getting involved in the drug scene again. Police had raided several houses around Wellington looking for him, and he'd just gone on the run. He ended up in the hills above Wainui Amata. He went on a rampage. Police say he'd fled into dense, rugged bush, armed with a shotgun, pistol and knife. On the 6th of January 2007, Graham Burton gunned down a young man riding a quad bike, then stabbed him to death. He then unloaded his shotgun on a pair of mountain bikers and took a father and daughter hostage. He had the gun out and he said, oh, the safety's off, start the bike. Um, you know, one person's dead, we don't want anything else to happen. As police rushed to establish a cordon, Burton advanced on two officers at the end of the trail. A gunfight ensued and Burton took a bullet to the leg. He was hoping the police would kill him. They shot him in the leg, huge blood loss and he lost a leg. Even though he was now in custody, 
Burton was considered to be extremely dangerous and capable of anything. Anne-Marie May was the only radio reporter allowed into the high security hearing. So this hearing room is where I first ever uh, came face to face with Graham Burton. It says hearing room, fairly innocuous words, but it's actually known uh, quaintly as the Hannibal Lecter cell. Just enough room for a judge at the desk there, a clerk next to them. They opened the door there and wheeled in Graham Burton in his wheelchair. There was an armed defender squad person, the big hat, the body suit and all of that, holding this great big gun. They were really concerned that even with his disability by that stage, he might do something awful. Graham Burton pleaded guilty and was given one of the highest sentences we've ever seen. When he'd eventually been sent to jail, he attacked another prisoner. He was belting along down that hallway. So even though he's disabled now, he still can move really fast and is still considered significantly dangerous. But the big questions remained. Why was he even released in the first place? And what had gone so wrong with the parole process? I was the chairman of the board, so I felt responsible for the decisions we'd made, and I was responsible. Even though the parole board and Sir David Carruthers took the blame, it became clear a bundle of issues led to this tragedy. He was given a $100 food voucher when he got out of jail, but it ran out on the day he got out. So then he had nothing, no food, no money. There was not uh, a, a, a clear understanding by the parole board of some incidents that had happened in prison. If they'd known about those things, they probably wouldn't have released him. Now the shooting rampage by convicted killer Graham Burton is triggering a revamp of the law. The Prime Minister's promising tougher rules for inmates applying to leave prison before their sentence is up. Parole is a privilege. It's not an entitlement and it's not a right. Uh, the law will be amended to make that abundantly clear. Inquiries into what happened led to changes in the system to prevent the same thing happening again. It is unique. I hope that's truly the case and it never ever happens again. But predicting human behaviour, even with the best risk assessment tools and the best structured decision making model and the best information is always going to be an art rather than a science. Dr Paul Wood is a psychologist working in central Auckland. I think Graham's a great example of someone who's a little too well adapted to his prison environment. Paul is uniquely positioned to talk about parole, prison and human behaviour. At age 18, Paul was addicted to morphine when his mother died of cancer. I made a decision to catch up with a drug dealer and as a result of that decision, conflict occurred and he ended up dead and I ended up spending the first night of what would be the next uh, nearly 11 years in prison. Paul completed a masters in psychology while in prison. He's now serving his life sentence on probation. Yeah, so it might just be what the next stage of your career might be or it might be how to perform more effectively in terms of what you're doing now. As a prisoner, he did all he could to prove to the parole board he'd turned his life around. It's such an intense experience, you know, you're going to see these people who literally have your life in their hands and who can give you anywhere from a parole release date to a three-year stand down, so don't even come and see us for three years. Yeah, I just remember how compassionate Judge Carruthers was. The significance of what Paul did was he was clearly trying to construct a future for himself after prison, which wouldn't be involved with crime or criminal offending, and which was going to be a contribution to society, not a detraction from it. He said to me, before we say anything else, I want to let you know that we're going to release you. We're going to give you a release date. And whew, <laughs> I just <laughs> burst into tears and just been so, so happy. The parole board has these tensions between, is this person an ongoing risk to the community right now? And what is that risk? Versus if we keep them in for longer, does it actually mean that they can less effectively reintegrate? and come back into society. It costs nearly $100,000 per bed per year to keep somebody in prison. 
Now that's a lot of hip operations. The longer someone's been in prison, the more challenging it is to predict how they'll behave once they're out, particularly if they think they shouldn't be there in the first place. On the very first day, I said I won't accept this sentence. His defence was that the gun went off accidentally. The jury never bought that. Well, Dean was a young, a young criminal. He styled himself on James Dean. That's why he called himself Dean. That's not his real name. Dean Wycliffe found fame as one of New Zealand's most notorious criminals. He was convicted of murder following a botched jewellery heist in 1972, and having spent more than 38 years incarcerated, is one of New Zealand's longest serving prisoners. He's serving a life sentence, but should he still be behind bars? When I see Dean, if the matter comes up, obviously I'll say, too old for jail, mate. It's a young man's game. Jailed for selling heroin as a student, Professor Greg Newbold turned his life around to become one of the country's leading criminologists. I was a prison inmate during the 1970s. I was there when Dean Wycliffe first escaped in 1977, and I got out of prison in 1980. Oh, I think Dean's back in prison do, ser serving a life sentence and I think he's probably mellowed out quite a lot. Dean Wycliffe was born in 1948 in the Bay of Plenty. His best friend was Niven Ray. This was the, this was the photograph and we were positioned over here, had to sit on the side. We weren't allowed in the photo because we were we were a bit too white for it because of that there. Because <laughs> it's New Zealand Māori in colour. <laughs> we weren't dark enough for the book. There's uh, Wycliffe there, Uncle Davy Wycliffe and old Ma Wycliffe. For hard people, real hard. Dean could have had a great life here, eh? Like nearly three quarters of his life was been behind bars or being institutionalised. So he's missed a lot. You know, he's missed a lot of things. His father formed a relationship with a, a, another woman and it's alleged that there was a fair bit of abuse. Dean, he was around and all of a sudden he just disappeared and I gather that was when trouble started happening. He'd been through detention centre, he'd been through Borstal. Most guys came out of Borstal with an education about how to commit more serious crimes and get away with it. At the beginning of March of 1972, Dean had been planning the ultimate heist. At approximately 8.45 on the morning of Friday, the 10th of March, as shops and businesses were opening up for a long day, Dean wandered into Royal Oak Jewelers in Cuba Street, Wellington, produced a war issue revolver. He gave a duffel bag to Mrs Cameron and instructed her to load it up with money and jewellery. Now, out of the corner of his eye, Dean saw somebody advance towards him, and it was Paul Neard, who was the 27-year-old son of the business owner. A scuffle happened. Paul Mead was fatally injured. Dean was arrested for murder, but claimed in court he never meant to shoot anyone and did not deserve a life sentence. From a legal point of view, usually if you take a loaded weapon and you're intending to commit another crime and the weapon kills somebody, usually that's statutory murder. The only eyewitness had said in trial that Dean had shot him in cold blood. His defence was that the gun went off accidentally. The jury never bought that. Dean was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. But he always disputed the facts. When he was in prison, he refused to see the parole board and refused to cooperate with prison authorities. He was a tough little bugger, if I can use that expression. Uh, he wouldn't back down. I had been framed up, but from my point of view, right from the beginning, from the very first day, I said I won't accept the sentence. He fought for 10 years. He was in solitary for 10 years, and that was a long time for a man to be there because he felt he wasn't guilty of murder. He made history by being the first prisoner ever to escape from Parimarimo prison. He became a legend, there's no doubt about that. After the passage of the Official Information Act in the early 1980s, Dean discovered notes of an interview with the only eyewitness to the crime, taken immediately after the uh, police arrived at the murder scene, confirming Dean's version of what had happened. The statement confirmed the gun went off during a struggle and the shooting was accidental. 
that had been withheld from the defence. The Court of Appeal said that that probably wouldn't have altered the verdict. And so Dean went on a hunger strike until the Prime Minister, David Longy, promised Dean they would order a review. The Court of Appeal then said the jury may well have delivered a verdict of manslaughter had it known that the eyewitness and changed her mind. His offence was reduced from murder to manslaughter, but for some reason the sentence remained the same. He was the first person since 1914 to get life imprisonment for manslaughter. The conditions of parole are irrelevant. The fact is I've been given a life sentence for an accident. Like many prisoners, when Dean was finally paroled, he had difficulty adjusting to life on the outside. They're getting out and it's all going to be different. They're never going to come back to jail and they're going to have a job and they're going to have beautiful wives. And then suddenly they get out and they've got to provide meals and pay power bills and, and do their own washing. I'd spent 10 years basically showing up at the prison servery and collecting my meal and dropping my laundry bag off. For security reasons, the first thing prison attempts to do is remove all opportunities for personal responsibility and accountability. He was really a fish out of water. He didn't know how to use a public telephone. He didn't know what popcorn was. The best way I can describe it is like being in a time machine for 28 years, and then when you step out, you're on a different planet. And everyone on this planet looks like you, but they're far in advance to the world that you knew. He said to me, I've just spent years in prison. I need a rest. And I said, hey, Dean, you just had a rest. <laughs> Everybody out here goes to work. But he couldn't see that. The hardest thing for us was he, we all tried. We, a lot of us did try, you know, to, to get him on a straight and narrow and do it right. And... He was f Dean Famous Wycliffe down the pub. Everybody wanted to know him. But soon he was just Dean, who was down the pub every night. And that glamour soon died. It wasn't long after that that he robbed the video parlour. A life sentence is a life sentence. You can be recalled any time, up until the point in time that you die. And Dean was recalled for the robbery, then he was recalled again. And now he's back in prison on drugs charges. He's now 65. Well, here we are at Spring Hill Prison. I'm going to uh, visit Dean Wycliffe, see how he's getting on. I haven't seen him for about 15 years. So there'll be a, quite a bit to talk about, I think. Hope's an important thing, a sense of progress when you're trying to work with someone and convince them to remain engaged and to make the personal change that they need to do in order to return to the community. Making it on the outside while serving a life sentence can be difficult, and re-entering society has a unique set of challenges. Do you find much discrimination or people who do judge you when they find out about your background? The problem where murder is concerned is that if a person's killed once, then the parole board needs to be very careful about releasing that person because they've shown a propensity to kill and they may well kill again. But people change. You're not the same person when you're 50 as you were when you were 17 or 18 or 20. And the function of the parole board is to recognise that. Did I ask you out for coffee the next day? Yeah. Yeah, I asked him out for coffee the next day. And then I went home and Googled him, and then it came up with, uh, a, like, convicted killer gets master's degree. And I was just like, what? Like, this is crazy. Uh, yeah. And then I just read a bit further. I watched his TED talk, and then I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I got my brother to watch the TED talk, and then I said, oh, I'm going out for coffee with this guy tomorrow. And he goes, oh, he sounds pretty cool. I had to message him and tell him that I that I'd Googled him. Mm. Um, and then he said, you know, it's OK if you don't want to come and meet me for coffee. But mm. I just said, no, I'm still keen. Working as a psychologist in central Auckland, father-to-be Paul has never met another lifer on the outside. Like Paul, Shane White was convicted of murder and sentenced to a 10-year non-parole period. He is now serving his life sentence on probation. It's how Shane's been able to adjust to living life fully on parole 
that Paul's interested in talking about today. I can't get out of it. Yeah, yeah. I can't get out of it. And, um, you know, this has been, this been my world. My tribe asked me to come back three weeks ago and be a judge at our tribal culture festival, even though the next day I have to go and tell my probation officer I haven't done anything bad and sign the offender paper. Do you find much discrimination or people who do judge you when they find out about your background? All the time. And I'd counter that by just getting that right on the table straight away. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shane, I'm a lifer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're going any further? Good, OK, then let's carry on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get it out of the way quickly. My paid role is to be the project facilitator for Patu Tangangara, a Ministry of Health service provider required to give service around um, support, advocacy and referral services for people suffering from the detrimental effects of methamphetamine. So it seems to have taken me right back into that whole area of jail, gangs, crime, and that's most probably around something to do with my past that allows me to go into jail and have real conversations with people and get past the bullshit. I've got a little Nana car with a warrant in a rego because I can't drive an old gangster car because it gets pulled over all the time. So I've got a little silver Nissan Primera. I'm a believer in a case-by-case -case basis. Seems to make much more sense. I'm a believer in a targeted approach, not just a blanket approach. It's a fine line. You know, there's one, one part of it is I'm on life parole. They can tell me to do anything. Where to live, where to work, who to associate with. At the moment, I'm at the maximum reportage time, which is every two months. We were raised up in state houses. We had a free bedroom house in Books Road in Ranui, where my nine members of my family lived, and my uncle and auntie and their three kids lived in the garage, and my other uncle and auntie and their two kids lived in the sitting room. My passion as a youngster was owning a car. And we quickly realised that there's a much better way of having an income, and that's taking other people's cars and converting them into my cars and selling pieces of cars. I perfected a way of stealing Commodores so I could get it down to getting into a car and get it rolling in less than 30 seconds. Half of my life, I've got the things that I, I felt were important. Some money, a nice car, not trapped in a job where you have to work from day and night every day just to meet the rent. Better to uh, die on your feet than live on your knees. A friend of mine, not a friend, he was a burglar. He got involved with my sister and they went out to a party. And at that party, she was uh, drugged um, you know, in some way uh, and, and um, then gang raped. Obviously, um, something had happened to her, just her whole demeanor. She, you know, the way she held herself, the way she spoke. She asked me to give him a hiding. First time in her whole life she'd ever asked me to give anyone a hiding. This fella's affiliated, uh, he's got a crew around him. There's no way I'm gonna be able to go in there as a car thief, give him a hiding. I was a 17 year old nine stone fella. Hey, hey. No, the police were never an option. Oh well, I'll take my own gang and it's um, called a double barrel Winchester. But I decided I'm gonna shoot you and I'm gonna go to jail and do life. And once I'd made that decision, now I was just in the mode of finding him and I drove around all day and all night till I found him. But I challenged him to a fight. He didn't realise I had a gun. And I dragged him out of the pub, took him down the park and shot him. By seven o'clock, eight o'clock the next morning, I was arrested at gunpoint in South Auckland. My sister came up every week without fail this whole 10 years and did everything she could to, uh, to make my life up there comfortable. Around 21, I realised I've still got quite a few years left in here but I'm not going to die here. Dr Peter Sharples was working with inmates in prison when he noticed Shane. In those days, one gang had uh, A block, another one had B block. So you and I could be best friends every day, joke, share. But if something went down and we're in different gangs, we're enemies, just like that. And it's that sort of hot and cold stuff that really uh, shook Shane and it, because he didn't want to be part of of a, a total allegiance to a gang. In the early 90s, Peter was pioneering new courses in traditional Māori martial arts based at Hawani Waititi Marae.
The marae came to me in jail. They came in there and they started um, teaching the men in jail some, some stuff that suited men, the physical martial arts, performing arts, visual arts stuff. It was almost my gang, the kapaka team. They didn't actually have to have a turf war with anybody, didn't have, didn't have colour issues and had a whole lot of other gang members join. We get word and we're in there doing different projects and we can see good guys and guys that need nurturing. And um, he was obviously one. Now that you're in jail and you don't, it's not about, because who cares what car you drive in jail, eh, boy? Yeah, what have you got? You got you. Yeah. And who are you? You don't even know. Somehow he managed to stay positive towards the end of his uh, time. I've done every course, everything, right down to joining the Samoan culture group. People can, uh, I think, spend up to 10, 12 years beyond their parole date uh, in prison. The corrections department, they know and they taught us that 10 years is the absolute maximum a person, a normal person, could spend in jail without being institutionalised. Peter Shuffles came to my parole board hearing banged the table, if I remember correctly, and even might have said a swear word um, around giving him, giving me an opportunity. Um, I'm not the 17-year-old boy that got locked up. Shane rose to the occasion and became an integral part of this marae complex and all the programs. Me mihi au ki tene marae. They, uh, I must acknowledge the marae and everyone here okay, who, yeah. who, who don't see me as my past. There's only a few people you can really rely on for the gutsy stuff in your life. He's uh... one for me. And ring him and ask him for stuff and he does it, and vice versa. I contribute to some of the corrections, wānanga that are run here, tikanga programs they're referred to as, which are reconnection, self-identity. Tomorrow, there'll be the youth court running in here and I'll be sitting up with the youth court judge um, giving advice and direction towards some young people who came through the system. Last year, actually, when my dad died and I was sitting in hospital next to him um, for his last couple of weeks when he shared some of the stuff. And, uh, you know, some of the guilt he felt because he felt, that's my job, I should have gone and shot that boy. And I, I had to tell him it was none of our jobs. And, and it didn't do anything for anybody. Another, man, another Māori man dead, another Māori man in jail, and, uh, and, and my sister feeling what? Cured. Or better, yeah, you know, it was a lose-lose situation. Anyone that made anything out of it was the corrections department. Managed to spend another million dollars keeping someone locked up. How are you? But for some, the amount it costs keeping people locked up is worth it, no matter how high. Some of the families are still in court and hear that word, a life sentence, and they breathe a sigh of relief. He's got a life sentence. It's so deflating when somebody tells them that that's 10 years unless the judge has put a non-parole period on it. But the judge gave life. No, he didn't. He had the ability to, but he didn't. For the families of victims, parole can mean a lifetime of terror. So he did. He shot mum in the head. It would be absolutely bonkers yeah. to let that guy out. The majority of lifers who get out of prison get out and they've had a long time to think about their crime. The majority get out and live crime-free lives. It's only a very small minority who go on to kill again. But they're the ones that have to be watched. Pensioners John and Josephine Harrison were murdered in their Waikato home by thrill killers. Here, you want a good look? This tragedy threw the murdered couple's family headlong into the criminal justice system. 20 years later, daughter Margaret and son-in-law Jock are haunted still with a stark reminder on a yearly basis. John and Josephine Harrison, Margaret's parents, they lived in Henderson and they moved down to the Waikato and that was to be their retirement spot. Um, out in the country, away from the, the big smoke. They had their 50th wedding anniversary here. It was the 28th, and then it was on the 1st that they were murdered in the middle of the night. Gresham, Marsh and Leith Ray were on a burglary spree in the Waikato area. They were in possession of a stolen rifle, and they called in to John and Josie Harrison's house and bought some produce because they had a stall at their gate. What um, John and Josie did not realise was that they were actually looking for a soft target. They went back just on dark and Mum and Dad were still up. 
There was a lounge window open, so they just stayed outside in the garden waiting for mum and dad to go to bed. And then they climbed into the lounge through the window and sat in the dark. One of them started coughing and that's what alerted dad. He got up and told them to clear off, but they didn't go. So dad said, I'm calling the police. Leith Ray had the gun and Marsh told dad to freeze and he didn't. He kept moving towards the kitchen. Leith Ray was told to get him so he did, he followed Dad and shot him in the back and he fell to the floor. And Ma Mum called out from the bedroom, what's going on? So Marsh went into the bedroom and told Leithray to come and um, deal to Mum. So he did, he shot Mum in the head. And then the gun changed hands, Marsh shot Mum. Dad was still alive and he shot Dad in the face because Dad was moaning. He shot Dad in the face. <laughs> Rex Miller was one of the main detectives on the case. The weapon used was a 22. People say, oh, it's only a 22, but 22s can kill. Mr. Harrison was on the floor in the kitchen and his wife, she was still sitting up in bed. He was partially sighted from memory. Even if they hadn't have touched her, she wouldn't probably have even recognised who they were. We had a knock on the door just after midnight to find two policemen on the doorstep. They were tracked down on Waiheke Island by the armed defenders. Yeah, you want a good look? They told the police everything. They thought it was cool. I remember Marsh more than Ray mainly because I think he got off on it. He was quite proud of himself. It was just standing room in, in the courtroom. I reckoned if they had a gun, they would have just shot everybody. They just looked so callous. I'm not a psychiatrist, but one of his red wires was touching the blue up in his head and it wasn't working somehow. Marsh and Ray were given a 10-year non-parole sentence. Every year after that 10 years is up, the offender is entitled to seek to be paroled. Today it's Gresham Marsh's hearing. Jock, have you got your submission? Oh, yeah. If he can convince the parole board that he is safe to be let out, then the parole board may let him out. There is no obligation whatsoever on the victim to attend the parole board hearing. That parole board hearing will happen regardless. This is our ninth year of uh, parole board hearings for two separate offenders. One of the main reasons Jock and Margaret keep attending these hearings is because they're afraid if let out, Gresham Marsh will kill again. With the help of Garth McVicar and Ruth Money from the Sensible Sentencing Trust, they're intent on making sure Gresham Marsh is kept behind bars. We have got speaking rights, so if the victim finds themselves um, you know, unable to speak, then we're able to fill in until they co compose themselves again and that type of thing. So today we're hoping that the parole board uh, will rule in our favour. This person is completely unsafe. He has a high risk, absolute high risk to public safety. Constantly abusing the family and abusing the process and abusing the corrections department while he is a tenant in their jails. Yes. Are great. Oh. The role of the murder victim's family in deciding when their loved one's killer should be released was solidified in 2002 with the Victim and Parole Acts. The first time we had to go to a parole board hearing, we felt we were the actual offenders. Over the course of years, things have become a bit better, and today the victim can speak to the parole board as of right. Inside, Jock and Margaret will be talking to the parole board via video conference. They'll be voicing their fears and explaining why they don't believe Gresham Marsh should be released. The board will take this information to Marsh's hearing in several days' time. This particular one, it was so cold and calculated, I would advocate that it's one of the ones where you, you, you put the key in a bloody envelope and don't return it to the sender. Um, you know, they stay there. You might otherwise think, well, they're ready to go, they've done all they can do, but they'll say something or give something away in front of the board. And I can think of one or two cases where the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. And you think, if that's what you're thinking, if that's what's in your head, then how can we have confidence that, that it won't happen again? 
as You're best right. we could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. We were able to explain to them his latest behaviour and accusations, which they knew nothing of. I think they would be absolutely bonkers yeah. to let that guy out. As a good friend of mine once said, a lot of these people, they're just oxygen thieves. The decision over Marsh's chance of release will be sent to Jock and Margaret in a fortnight's time. Yeah, you want a good look? Jock and Margaret are about to find out if Gresham Marsh, the killer of Margaret's parents, will get released on parole. The news was Gresham Marsh had once again been declined parole, which means that he'll be spending uh, another year, which will be his 20th year, in uh, Her Majesty's care. They do an assessment of these people um, before each parole hearing, psychological assessment. They've got them rated fairly highly uh, uh, in terms of a risk. They're still medium to high, which in our book is too high for anyone to be released. There are some people so despicable in this country who have committed such a heinous crime, we should throw away the key on them. They're... I don't believe we can rehabilitate those people, but realistically, in my eyes, it shouldn't be about them. It should be about trying to help the family that they have offended against to try to get out the other end of that. The only way we can help that family to come to terms with that is to um, make sure they're never, ever in conflict with that offender again. For families of murder victims, this is one of the biggest dilemmas of the parole system. Attending hearings gives families a chance to speak out against the killer, but being part of this process year after year can be a living nightmare. Except in special cases, offenders are considered for parole every year once they become eligible. Jock and Margaret, along with sensible sentencing, are fighting to change this. In Parliament, fairly soon, they'll be presenting the Parole Reform Bill, and the intention is to perhaps have a two-year period between parole hearings instead of one. We're here for the uh, Law and Order Select Committee hearing into the Parole Amendment Bill. The bill has some stated intention to make it easier for the victim. And we are certainly going to speak to that and I hope that some change is made. Gresham Marsh will almost certainly re-offend if released. He is a dangerous psychopath. We've found that at some hearings, the offender has done very little in the 12-month period. The parole hearing should be held every two years instead of the current 12-month period. The role of families of victims in the criminal justice system is controversial. One of the interesting and, and again problematic issues is the extent to which victims can and should be involved in those hearings. I mean, it must be incredibly distressing, particularly when, from my understanding of the Parole Act, the primary criterion for the Parole Board is the individual's risk, not the suffering of the victims. And clearly, there's a disconnect there. All of those people, all they ever want is to make sure that tragedy, similar tragedy, doesn't happen to anyone else. And um, I can't... Oh, goodness, um, that's huge for me to be able to be a part of that. It was gratifying to hear that um, you feel the parole board procedures have improved, and mm. you know, I think you're right in giving credit to David Carruthers. I think he did a, a terrific job on that. Uh, he did push us process. along for restorative justice, which we didn't favour, but yeah. No, no, that's OK. He then, needs to put it to you, but yeah, that's, that's right. where you're in control of the process, because you don't have to do it if you don't believe that it's going to be helpful. Mm. Restorative justice involves um, meetings between the person harmed, wronged, and the person who did the wrong or harm with their families or supporters to negotiate an outcome which holds the person who did the harm responsible. My dad and, and, um, and Aaron Parker's dad, the man I shot, um, they drank together and they had their laughing and their crying over the beers a few times. I made an approach to the family if they wanted to take the opportunity to do, to, I don't know what, maybe yell and scream, maybe have a talk, uh, they declined. Since then, there hasn't ever been a, um, a chance to sit down and talk for me to apologise or, or, or anything like that. In the cases that I've seen where victims have exercised that right and it's been appropriate, there have been some remarkable um, outcomes for victims in a freeing sense. Since the turn of the millennium, sentencing for murder has become increasingly political. As fierce debate raged, a prospect for a fair sentencing system was caught in the crossfire. 
The only way that you will cure this is to get some bipartisan consensus in the parliament between the political parties so that they stop every three years trying to make political capital out of horrific offences. With concerns growing over harsher sentences, a sentencing council was suggested in 2006. This would keep us more in line with the rest of the world, provide guidance to judges, and ensure sentencing was kept separate from politics. I think we need to find a mechanism for setting sentence levels um, in a way that's different from the mechanism that we've followed to date. Now that, of course, is why when I was a law commissioner, I advocated the establishment of a sentencing council, and indeed the Sentencing Council Act was enacted. But it was never put into effect. It's still on the books, which uh, seems exceedingly strange to me that you have a law passed by Parliament that hasn't been brought into effect. Uh, it would have rationalised sentencing a good deal. It would have produced more standardisation, more fairness and fewer anomalies. But uh, for reasons of law and order on the right, it was not uh, implemented. In 2008, it was announced the new national government would not be setting up the Sentencing Council. It's legitimate to have the position that prison should be about punishment and that life should mean life. And it's legitimate to have the position that prison should be about reintegration and reducing the likelihood of reoffending. The real key of any position is to be really honest about the outcomes that you desire from promoting that course of action. And I think that's the thing where there's not that type of clarity and there's not that type of honesty. In the meantime, what is certain in New Zealand is people are being held in prison longer than ever before. Well, Dean's in the self-care units, which is a, a low security unit for trustees. Well, he's had enough of prison. He's growing old and he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in jail. It costs us in this country about $100,000 a year to have a prisoner in prison and most of us would rather spend that money in better parts, more constructive parts of our country. So if we are sensible and intelligent about release, there's a lot of money to be saved. Can't be a driver, but it's, it's, it's a consideration in thinking about a system. We should certainly look at where others do better. For instance, we might ask ourselves why Finland was able to reduce their rate of imprisonment so dramatically without any change in their crime rate at all. If you wish to promote harsher sentences purely for punishment, that's fine, because that's what you will achieve. If you wish the prison environment to be as hostile as possible for punishment, that's legitimate, because that's what you'll achieve. But if you promote longer sentences or a harsher prison environment on the basis of achieving a reduced likelihood of reoffending or achieving less offending in the first place, then you need to be able to back that up. And it's just not what our experience of incarceration and punishment suggests. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.